This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio. Definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. In the mid-1950s, author Jerry Viss was the first in his family to attend college. It wasn't the college of his choice, but the only possibility presented to him, Washington Missionary College, a strict Adventist school just north of Washington, D.C. As he departed for WMC, Jerry's uncle, on the sly, gave him this insightful advice. To become your own person, you need to learn how to think for yourself, not what others want you to think. In this memoir, Jerry intuitively follows his uncle's advice and makes friends with some unusual characters. Jerry Viss spent the earliest years of his life in Patterson, New Jersey, where he was born in 1939 into a blue-collar family struggling to overcome the lingering effects of the Great Depression. He has an MFA in fine art, and taught for many years in public school and college. He's the author of Patterson Boy, My Family and Other Strangers, a memoir in 28 stories, and is presently finishing a new story collection. Bob and the Beatniks, written by Jerry Viss, read by Terry Ray. I returned to college in the fall, a more confused young man than ever. Really, how could that be? I started the summer feeling as though I was wing-walking on a rolling stunt plane. Then, for better or worse, I met Don, who was interesting, so that was mostly better. Then I discovered Ayn Rand's writing, which made sense yet seemed too strident. Because of Don's insistence, I went to strip clubs, which I really didn't like, but that left me wide open for ridicule. Now I felt as though I was wing-walking with a sack of rocks balanced on my head. Why couldn't I be normal like my friend Doug? Comfortable in my own skin. Doug and I had gone to Shenandoah Valley Academy together, and we graduated the same year. SVA was a strict Seventh-day Adventist boarding school, and now here we were at Washington Missionary College, another strict Adventist school. I'm not sure how we decided to room together in college. We weren't particularly close in high school. It was easy going, but too much of a straight arrow for me. I was always on the lookout for something less, well, presentable. Doug was the epitome of organized. For instance, when removing his clothes at night, he neatly arranged the contents of his pockets on the top of his dresser, hung his belt on a hook he had installed in the closet, and lined up the pant seams to smooth out the legs before placing them on a hanger. He even wore pajamas. I slept in the buff. And there's more. He actually changed his bed sheets weekly, changed his underwear and socks daily, polished his shoes bi-weekly with religious zeal, and flossed twice a day. Brutally punctual, he never skipped a class or a religious service. Doug was habitually cheerful, thoughtful, courteous, and well-groomed, all of which made me feel uncomfortable and apprehensive. I assumed... The opposite of me is what he probably would have preferred in a roommate, though he never said so. I'm sure, in his mind, we were good friends. And we were, as long as I repressed the real me, which I did, for the first few weeks at least. Tucked away in a teeny brain wrinkle at the base of my skull was a tiny condemning voice that murmured, he's a lifer. That is, someone born an Adventist. That in itself was almost enough to make me avoid slouching at my desk, but it was compounded by the fact that he was born in Pennsylvania, 
How that entered into the equation was, well, somewhat elliptical. To begin with, I couldn't spell Pennsylvania. Regardless of my inadequate spelling skills, my real difficulties with Doug arose from the toxic combination of his being a lifer, coupled with his Pennsylvania persona. Of course, such a persona only existed in my mind. Why I needed to wrap this biased view around Doug made no sense. But like all such judgments, made by humanity, it is easier than thinking clearly. First of all, Pennsylvania wasn't New Jersey. William Penn, the state's founder, was a religious loony. According to the British Crown, he was cut from the same cloth of lunacy as the pilgrims, only worse. The king would have cut his head off for seditious slander against the Church of England, but William's father was an admiral in His Majesty's Navy, so, instead, the king gave him Pennsylvania as punishment. This solution cut two ways. It secured that bit of land in the New World for the crown, and it created a place to send any future eruptions of loonies. William, a convert to Quakerism, a believer in religious tolerance, exclusively for European Protestant Christians, threw open the embracing arms of Pennsylvania to Mennonites, Amish, Anabaptists, Moravians, Dunkers, Huguenots, Schwenkfelders, Scot-Irish, Presbyterians, also at odds with the crown, and numerous other, even more obscure Protestant groups. That was Pennsylvania. The Adventists were a combination of Pennsylvania Anabaptist ideas and the end-of-the-world Millerite movement of the 19th century. My state of New Jersey, just a bit to the east and protected by the Delaware River, was a world apart from the quiver of straight arrows in Penn's land. New Jersey was founded by pragmatic Dutch businessmen. They came to the New World from Holland in pursuit of wealth, not salvation. My mother's family came to New Jersey from Holland in the 1630s. My father side in 1905. Neither branch of the family had any business acumen or in-depth religiosity until four years before my college stint. That's when my parents became Adventists through the determined efforts of a local missionary working the fertile pagan blue-collar fields of Patterson, New Jersey. Unlike Doug, I was not a native son of bucolic Penlandia, but a son of paved-over, industrial, pragmatic, tough-as-nails Jersey, a mere commoner from beyond the Delaware River. Thus, I could justify picturing him as a myopic, self-satisfied Pennsylvanian when he entered our dorm room with a sigh while looking up to heaven for sympathy as he beheld the wonder of me. My image of Doug was admittedly ungenerous and existed on a subconscious level. As a result, I didn't anticipate the possible ramifications that were soon to bite me in the ass when the real me, or at least the more real me, entered stage left. At least Doug didn't have a squawking parakeet like my former roommate. That was a relief. But I realized that life had replaced a feathery problem with a dust bunny human. Parakeet Paul from Baltimore I could talk to. Doug from Pennsylvania? Not at all. I needed someone less presentable to associate with. This was a severe challenge in an institution that seemingly excluded no one, but then spared no effort to eradicate any nonconformist tendencies. I should have understood this after four years at a religious high school. Instead, I seesawed unsuccessfully between the demands of religious constraints and my desire for personal expression. I lived by the rules in public and dodged them internally. My understanding of what did and didn't make sense was becoming exponentially confused. By choice, I had no job. It was a small rebellion and the first sign that my tenure at this school was doomed. My father wanted me to help offset costs at this Adventist college, the only one he would pay for. I had assured him that I would do so. Most students at the school had jobs. But working for 50 cents an hour for the school was insulting, which I pointed out to my roommate and anyone else who would have the nerve to tell me that my attitude was uncooperative. And I would add, as my leftist uncle would have explained, the school's work policy exploited the young by paying less than fair compensation, which denied a local family man a decent job. The few times I defended myself with this argument resulted in pained expressions and head shaking. Instead of working for 50 cents an hour, I opted to spend the afternoon work periods in my room, bored and depressed. The room, 
a major contributing factor to my depression, was an indifferent institutional color. It had bare, worn wood floors, scarred but indestructible furniture, and a tiny, south-facing, grimy window that did nothing to drive away the rampant dreariness. It was barely fit to sleep in. I made the grave error of complaining to Doug, who had the nerve to point out that my dilemma was self-inflicted. I had to admit, though grudgingly, that he was right. Boredom is always due to your own laziness. This situation called for a creative effort. I should have had a job. That would have eaten up most of those depressing afternoon hours. Instead, I made the creative decision to leave my door open on the off chance that a unique and interesting person wandering down the hall would stop in and distract me from my self-inflicted boredom. At the very least, leaving the door open seemed to dilute the compressed heaviness of the room. I imagined the room's yellow air oozing out along the floor into the hall, replaced by crisp, clean air through the top half of the doorway. <laughs> Delusional, perhaps, but it helped. The window would have done a better job, but it was painted shut. I had just finagled a swap. I traded my old brownie box camera for a small portable record player that needed a new electric cord. Possession of a record player was considered marginally okay with the institution, I mean college, as long as you played spiritually uplifting music, hymns only, according to the men's dean. I stretched his playlist to include somewhat suspect classical music. I played the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth with the door wide open, as loud as the player would go while loudly eyeing along. Oh, my God, a crisp, penetrating voice exclaimed from the doorway. I never expected to hear that in this hallway. Hi, I'm Robert Ramelli. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A master of non sequiturs, he added, Do you like poetry, too? He walked into the room, sat down beside me on the bed, and began massaging my shoulders. Well, you do look tense, he volunteered in a response to my puzzled look. I lied and said, not at all, I'm fine. I leapt up and got my dog-eared copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass from my debris-covered desk. He threw up his hands and glanced at the book as if it were covered with flies. Oh, Lord, no, I mean Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Isn't life amazing? As soon as I determined that my roommate wasn't a unique soul, I met someone who was a bit too unique. He was effeminate, possibly homosexual, though it didn't matter to me. He was a blessed relief, and I liked him. He was as tall and gaunt as an El Greco figure, and he appeared and disappeared like a specter most afternoons. Incomprehensibly, he too was a lifer. He was from somewhere in the South, which immediately gained my respect for his apparent survival skills. My own sojourn in Virginia, where I attended the Adventist High School, had left me somewhat scarred. I was known as a rude Yankee from irredeemably sinful New York City, even though I repeatedly pointed out that I was from New Jersey. Among Robert's multiple talents was a profound inability to be silent. He was a walking, unstoppable monologue of emotions, cultural artifacts, and unvarnished insights. I liked him best when his theatrics diminished and we'd talk about art or music, all new to me missing links among the many that I hadn't known were missing. Others warned that Robert was strange, as if I were deaf and blind, and that it wasn't wise to be seen with him. We'd occasionally sit together on the lawn or eat together in the cafeteria. In addition to being a fruit, as many referred to him, I was told he had a volatile, vicious side, and was cautioned that he would turn on me. What the others experienced, I knew, was his exquisite way of slicing through their pious pretense, which did abound. His quick wit was an immense part of his appeal to me. Robert introduced me to the music of Henry Purcell and 16th century Italian madrigals, Mahler's Das Lied van der Erde, pre-Raphaelite art, and the existence of the only truly perfect Gothic church in America, the Washington Cathedral on Wisconsin Avenue in D.C., I found his raw emotionality and mood swings more honest than the constrained, perpetual blandness of the other students. From the moment we first met, Robert overwhelmed my sense of reality. 
It was as though an all-consuming whirlwind had materialized out of nowhere. I could hardly find the energy or imagination to keep up with him. He made no sense and more sense at the same time. One day, after he left, and I sank back into the aura of my imprisoning room, I daydreamed that he was in a lineup against a wall with several other students. Which one of these are guilty of unacceptable behavior? came a deep voice of authority. I realized intuitively that this showy, frantic energy was a cover for loneliness. Of course. But how could he not be lonely in this narrow world of right and wrong? He was like a blaring siren, a bank of bright, blinding lights. One afternoon, my pious roommate, Doug, came back earlier than usual. He wanted to know what Robert was doing in our room. Was I gay? Did he try anything with me? He told me he didn't want him in the room again. I said nothing. Not because I didn't have any answers handy, but because I knew the answers would make no difference. Initially, after Robert's first visit, I considered keeping my door shut against him to avoid such questions, but I didn't. I trusted my intuitive side. In the heat of my roommate's demands, I chose Robert over Doug. It was simple. I had already come to the realization that Doug had nothing to offer. It felt like I had come home to myself, to trust my intuition, and not an arbitrary, rigid cast of mind. My decision about Robert made me feel whole and solid. I never tried to understand why. It was something remote, a vestigial remnant from my childhood, a sort of rusted internal barometer. Back then, if I didn't feel whole when I made a decision, it wasn't right. After Robert's first visit, a voice from the teeny wrinkle in my brain scolded me. You can't go through life like this. You may as well throw yourself out of an airplane without a parachute. That's right. I answered the wrinkle. It's like throwing myself out of an airplane. But I might miss something. I might discover that I've got wings. And it's time to learn to fly. Arguing with myself was also a remnant of my childhood, the result of being an only child. I was learning to trust my own choices, to trust my intuition, and to think sideways across the proscribed columns of that which was deemed acceptable. That's what made Robert's visits so appealing. My roommate be damned. The door would stay open to anyone curious enough to come in. One afternoon, the realization struck me that it wasn't my open door alone that drew Robert into my room. It was the music. It was the kind of music I played. If I varied the music, I might lure in other sorts. I avoided Ursat's religious recordings for obvious reasons. Nor did I play rock and roll. In the last few years I had, in small increments, gravitated away from pop music to classical and then to jazz. I began listening to people like Dave Brubeck, Thelonious Monk, the Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross trio. Django Reinhardt, and MJQ, the modern jazz quartet. I put Brubeck's Time Out album on and left the door open. Not too loud. I didn't want the assistant men's dean to hear the illegal strains of satanic music from his office on the floor below. I was lying on my bed, lost in the intricate 5-4 rhythms, when I sensed someone at the door. Cool stuff, man. He was dressed in a trench coat often his only bit of clothing, a slouch hat, sneakers, and no socks. You're Jerry. It was posed not as a question, but a point of confirmation for my benefit. All right, if I come in. With a subtle Pied Piper smirk, I nodded yes. What's your name, I asked. Bill Tice, he said. He climbed onto my roommate's immaculate bed and sat cross-legged with his unpolished, dirty shoes on the smooth coverlet. Watch the shoes, I said. Shh, don't cover up the cool sounds, man. Call me Tice. Uh, that's my roommate's bed, he ignored me. I had the pagan thought that the fates had brought Tice to my door to teach me about being cool. He was a beatnik or as close as anyone dared to be at WMC. Tice was another book carrier. Robert Ramelli carried Rossetti poems. I carried Leaves of Grass. 
and Tice carried Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Tice seldom spoke. Speaking wasn't cool. Emoting vibes was. If you had to talk, you weren't in the right groove. If Tice really liked something, he would nod, groan, and snap his fingers in appreciation, his imitated version of irrepressible beatnik joy. When he did speak, he mumbled inaudibly. There was a permanent sinister squint to his face, which was meant to hold ordinary mortals at bay. It certainly kept my roommate at bay. Murphy came through the door one day when Tice and I were in thrall of emoting. Murphy was from Baltimore. He roomed diagonally across the hall with a guy named Hoyt. They were known as Morph and Hooter. Morph was a studied cool like Tice. Hooter, I learned, was innately cool from birth. He was unpredictable and mysteriously aloof. One afternoon, I knocked on their door looking for Morph. I could hear someone moving around inside. I knocked again. Silence. And again, I knocked. There's no one here, said in a flat public announcement voice. Yes, there is. There's no one here, in the same flat tone. And who am I talking to, Hoyt? No one. When someone arrives, word will be sent to you. <laughs> Morph had read On the Road, but didn't carry it around with him. He was an in-your-face kind of guy. His physical presence left him no choice, and he pushed it to its limit. He was stocky with unruly dark hair. He wore round Coke bottle glasses that made his eyes seem as though they were 20 feet inside his head. His version of beatnik behavior was to be as articulate and loud as possible, and he excelled at both. Morph would interrupt the events of the moment with pithy, oblique statements that tangentially derailed anything we were doing. His intent was to expose the falseness of everyone's assumed reality. He never sat on a chair, except in class. It wasn't at all cool. When he came into my room, my pad, to listen to a record, he would slump on the floor with his head and neck angled up against a vertical surface. If you wanted to join him in a conversation, it was required that you do the same. One day, Doug found the three of us sprawled on the floor listening to jazz. His face stiffened. He didn't make a sound, but just glared at me and then turned and walked back out the door. At least Tice wasn't on his bed with his shoes on. Morph shouted one of his memorable bon mots at Doug's retreating back. Don't miss it if you can. He always will, I responded. We were all playing at being unique. We really didn't need to. Being ourselves was different enough in that place, but we were too young and insecure to know that. Our play acting only made our lives worse. In retrospect, we were so tame, no drugs, alcohol, or promiscuity. Little of our nonconformist behavior ever left the room. Even that sequestered, tepid posturing was far too much. It seeped out the open door, into the hallway, down the stairs, and into the brittle judgments swirling about the campus. Life at this college seemed both incomprehensible and far too easy to understand. Curiously, Robert and my beatnik friends never overlapped, which I knew wouldn't have worked for a very simple reason. Not because Robert was gay, but because we beatnik three were posturing while Robert was the real thing. We were cosmetic, he was flesh and bone. What we four did have in common was our mutual disdain for the judgmental life lurking outside my dormitory room. Eventually, Robert stopped coming around. Whatever it was that drew him to my room was no longer enough for him. We, Beatnik Three, did stay friends longer, but pretense, like an ill-fitting garment, doesn't serve as a useful purpose in the long run. Besides, the judgmental world, lurking immediately outside my room, finally took notice of us. Tice quit school. Murphy, no longer Morph, took to sitting on chairs, and I had my record player confiscated. But that is quite another story. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. 
This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com.